And we're back. And thank you to Young Spielberg with the All In 1.5 Extended Edition Remix. We're going all in. That was Thank uh, you to the super fans. That was really incredible, actually. We're back. I got to say. We're back. Thanks, Young Bestie. Spielberg. Yeah. Shout out, Young Spielberg. With us, the dictator, Chamath Polyhapatia, the rain man himself. David Sachs is definitely an excellent driver, and his dad lets him drive in the driveway. And the queen of quinoa spectacular david freeberg is with us we did an emergency pod we just had all agreed we're taking a nice break nothing's gonna happen over the new year this is the down period <laughs> and 2021 is gonna be delightful and simple and then all hell breaks loose we could start with the vaccine we could start with the capital we could start with georgia no, we have to start we have to start we have to start with the capital we have Let's to start, start with the, the capital obvious. all right so let me just run through the series of events that occurred here. There was a certification process, correct, Sachs, that goes on where the Electoral College gets counted. And somewhere at 10 a.m., Trump had a rally of thousands of uh, supporters. You were not there, David, correct? You weren't at this he rally. In, he was in, quote, unquote, Miami. <laughs> right. I think he's in the Miami Hilton on Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue right now. And he no. put up that fake Miami background. But the truth is, let's be honest here, um, Trump came out at 10 a.m. and had a rally. Jason, can we just take a step back for a second? Okay. Does, doesn't David Sachs look like Elliot Gould in Ocean's Eleven right now? He I mean, does. he's so <laughs> Elliot Gould. <laughs> he is a silver fox. And are you, I mean, you were very public about being in Miami over the new year. You took your talents to Miami. And I, we see this background. Um, so we can assume the dictators in his... Uh, pool house poker room we know that freeberg's in a ritz carlton somewhere based on the <laughs> furniture he's in his ritz carlton uh, <laughs> office and sax based on your background are you in miami right now yeah are you yeah, still no, there I, I still i'm still i'm still here okay but yeah. David, and did you meet I, with I, the I mayor or not i i haven't I actually met him i did meet him i went to like a tech uh event the other night and he was there so were you wearing um, masks at the tech event or were not? you wearing a mask mask they, or no mask it was, they were, they were oh, like masks. No. In, no, 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 I'll tell you. There were masks indoors, and then there was like COVID testing inside, and then you could graduate to the outdoor patio part where people generally weren't wearing masks. So, were you in conversations with people with no masks on? Is that what you're saying at this Yeah, event? but, you know, everyone's been like COVID tested like a zillion times, and it was mm -hmm. outdoors. And, you know, I'm willing to meet with people outdoors. You know, I generally don't do it indoors, huh. but I'm, yeah. I'm, I, I've, David, I've said that's my policy starting several months ago. David, can, we, you, can we rewind to April with that photo of Sachs? Do we have it where he was in the ski mask and the goggles and the helmet <laughs> and like the biohazard well, suit and like how things have changed? He's like, I'll go to Miami and have a chat with someone. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Look, you, you could... You could <laughs> you, you 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 could definitely do uh, how it started and how it's going right. uh, split yeah. photo for it, but but look, you're at like the sharing time, a banana split with someone, like you know, <laughs> like, well, he's literally because, on eBay and Alibaba buying ventilators right. <laughs> for his home <laughs> triage center. Well, I mean, we we had people from the WHO saying in March that the you know that the case fat the infection fatality rate was like seven percent. You know, and the two big things we learned after that were number one, that there was a huge distribution by age, 
right? And so somebody under 50 without comorbidities had a much, much, much lower risk. And then also the thing we learned is that the there's, there's maybe a 10x difference between the infection fatality rate and the case fatality rate. I mean, you guys know all this. Yeah. And so, so at, once we learned those things, um, I mean, I, you, you know, I think a rational person takes things like that into account. I changed my policy with respect to COVID, you know, and, and now, especially that we have, uh, you know, easy access to tests, which weren't available, you can get tested before going into a event. I have, so a, I, th- I have a question to add on to that. Do you own a fur Chewbacca outfit? <laughs> and were were you in Washington DC yesterday <laughs> with more paint on yeah. with more paint on your nipples? Do you have a podium? <laughs> Do you have Do a you have neck a- to waist <laughs> tattoo? <laughs> Are you standing behind a podium? Let me hide the the Viking horns that I've got stashed away here. <laughs> All right, listen. There was a great. There was a. Can, can yeah, we there, title? Can we title yesterday's event National Lampoon Siege of the Capitol? <laughs> I mean, it was like Animal House, like you know. Yeah, there was a great. There was a great tweet. Uh, by somebody saying this was uh, this was like the storming of the Bastille as perpetrated by the cast of Animal House. <laughs> right, totally. uh, and, there, and there was another there's another totally. great tweet saying uh, the Capitol now appears to be under the control of a man in a Viking mask. <laughs> um, <laughs> the best one. So, the best one was I have lost all respect for Nicolas Cage's ability to steal the U.S. Constitution. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, whatever copies. Left. All right, so let's just go through the chain of events here, and it was it was absolutely surreal because Trump literally went out to a, a mob of people um, and said, "I want you to march down Pennsylvania Avenue and show the GOP what it takes to have courage, etc." Mike Pence uh, apparently told Trump that he was not going to go to bat for him in this ceremonial um, process of counting the votes and. Lo and behold, you're watching this, you know, the objections going on to the electoral count and you see the Secret Service come rushing in and it becomes a, you know, very serious situation. And when you watch some of the videos, it is truly terrorizing that thousands of people overwhelm the police. And I guess I want to start with people's opinion on Trump's culpability in inciting what was very dangerous behavior four people are dead um so we you know while we're joking about the cosplay outfits a woman who was a an ardent trump supporter who is a vet who did four tours uh from what i've read and i shared the video with you before literally you know as they broke into the building was trying to breach another area of the building and she's climbing through a window and gets shot apparently by the secret service or the police and dies. And so it's all fun and games until four people are dead. And now somebody's lost their wife, daughter, no, but sister. Jason, Jason, I mean, there, there could have been 400 dead. There could have been 4,000 Absolutely. Dead. Yeah. I mean, this could have become a shootout at the OK Corral. I can't understand why the police showed the restraint they did. I mean, when you see them getting surrounded, I don't know if you saw the one. They didn't, uh, they didn't show restraint, Jason. There was no police. When you look at the amount of um security that's typically there and has been there for other situations and then you compare it to the amount of security knowing for a month and a half that this was coming it's um it just doesn't make any sense to me so i'm a little i'm a little dumbfounded that you know you couldn't have seen this facebook group called you know hashtag storm the capital which had tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of members in there, plotting and scheming, selling merchandise called Storm the Capital. You know, these guys were wearing uh, printed sweatshirts that they had time to make, um, and nobody knew about it, and nobody thought to reinforce um, the security and barricade it and make sure that you couldn't go from the protest site to the Capitol. I mean, it just seems like there's some level of complicity that needs to get found out here. But there was a there was an interview I saw with uh, an ex DC police guy who said that um, I think folks were told to tamper down uh, the police forces were told to tamper down on managing crowds and protests and riots following the controversy associated with BLM a few months ago and spraying folks with pepper spray and water and all the um, physical techniques that were used were so um, outraging. That, uh, that there was just more of a systemic concern about being too aggressive with protesters. And as a result, they went too far the other way. 
Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not an and unreasonable... So it just happens to be, Friedberg, that when black people protested and brown people, they got the tear gas and beaten with batons. And then when the white people uh, stormed the, the, the capital in the same area, they got uh, walked I, I, down the steps and escorted out with a stern warning to not do it again. I mean, it, this is hypocritical and insane. I, I, I don't know why you have to go there, particularly. Um, it, it, it looked to me like what happened is that the Capitol Hill police simply got completely overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at these, you know, giant, this is a rally on the mall that turned into a mob. Well, first it kind of turned into a tailgater, then it turned into a mob, and then it turned into an insurrection. It kind of stumbled forward into progressive uh, phases of, uh, stupidity. Of, of, of stupidity and disaster. But it's, it looked to me like the Capitol Hill police simply got overwhelmed. They, they obviously were unprepared. They were surprised, I think, by this. And I saw a video of tons of tear gas being used. I saw people getting tear gas like crazy. And I think there was reports uh, this morning on Twitter that the whole area in front of the Capitol there was covered in that light film that remains after tear gassing. So I don't think they were really pulling punches too much. And I also think that, uh, that th there will be prosecutions. I think that uh, the, the, these people were, were captured on video. There's a lot of talk on Twitter and everybody is in favor of finding out who they are, applying facial recognition and uh, bringing charges. So I think there will be a lot of charges, unlike let's say the, the BLM protests this summer. I don't remember anybody getting charged based on video of people rioting or looting. And then I think, you know, the, 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 the final difference actually with the BLM protests is that if you've watched Fox News at all in the last 24 hours, the condemnation of, what, of the storming of the Capitol of what happened has been across the board, both right and left. Everybody across the political spectrum has condemned it. Nobody is apologizing for it. Nobody on the right is looking for root causes to explain the reasons why it happened. Everybody is just condemning it and saying that it should never have happened and the people who did it should be prosecuted. And uh, so I don't see any kid gloves here being used, um, you know, I'll either tell you physically where I or see the kid glove sacks is when you see officers being chased up the steps and uh, or taking selfies, you know, which is one instance. I don't want to just say that's the only indicative in thing, but when people are breaking through windows, and just kind of being let go. I mean, they were obviously overwhelmed, but I'm surprised more people didn't get shot. Chamath, David, let's just David, tackle this what, head on in terms of the race issue. But I have and, a, well, I have a I have a question for David before okay. I make my statement. David, okay, do you think that if this were black and brown people storming the Capitol, would there have been more or less than four deaths? Uh, honestly, I think it would have been the same. I just uh, disagree. You know, I disagree. I, I really disagree. And I'll tell you why. Um, I think you have the best of intentions wanting to think that way. But here's the way I see it. I see a president that basically instigated a group of people who are fundamentally disenfranchised. Let's face it, like there are there are a lot of very, very reasonable Republicans and a lot of very reasonable Democrats. The fringes of both parties are functionally mentally retarded. We know this. Okay. And so what you see are extreme on both sides who are just completely lost and looking for any excuse. And so you have a president in the tail end of his presidency, an anonymous presidency, basically call them out. Nobody who actually had a job or anything to do could show up, right? So you had all these people show up. It's a Wednesday. Yeah. It's a Wednesday during the day. I mean, and what do you think happens? They're there. They're all frothed up. You know, um, Eric Trump frothing them up. Donald Trump Jr. frothing them up, Trump frothing them up, Giuliani frothing them up, and all of a sudden, as you said, stumbling into degrees of, of craziness and stupidity to storm the Capitol. And I just think to myself, how could a president instigate this kind of action, number one? The second thing I think about is when black athletes peacefully protested uh, something that they had the fundamental constitutional right to protest. In the president's eyes, they were sons of bitches. White people that stormed the fucking Capitol, the yep. people's house, yep. were called patriots by the president's daughter. 
and Which then she deleted. were told, and then were told that they were loved by the president himself. To me, it's just an enormously stark contrast of a double standard. I think that beyond the persecutions of the people, I actually feel very bad for the people that stormed the Capitol. I feel like these are folks that are on the fringes who just need a vessel and Trump is a vessel and then he instigate them and runs away. You know what I mean? He's a and coward. They, He's lost. And they, and these they are commit, lost people. That yeah. these guys commit the crime and now they're going to go to jail. I feel like the, the culpability has to go all the way back to Trump, to Hawley, to Cruz. These guys are the, those are the real scumbags in all of this. Freeberg, what, do you, what are your thoughts on this? And then I'll go back to Sachs and let him respond. Yeah, I don't I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that if this was a Black Lives Matter and, and, and it was uh, black people involved or brown people involved uh, in um, in the same sorts of activities you saw yesterday that you would not see uh, more shootings. I, I don't think that's an unreasonable uh, position to take. It, obviously, um, I think there's this other circumstance, which is that event preceding this one. As I mentioned, I, I saw an interview with a D.C. police um former police direct, director of the police or some, I forgot what his title was, where he highlighted that, you know, folks were kind of instructed to stand down following the BLM controversies. And so I think that's also kind of a reasonable point of view. And uh, is what Trump about is, the president's culpability? I mean, I think that's one issue that's yeah, going to have to be addressed post. And I think we have to figure out what life post Trump is going to be like, because this is a level of chaos that nobody to Sachs's point all people condemned. It's um, a, yeah, there's a there's a there's a theory which actually takes its origin from from Hitler, where uh, Hitler used this term, the big lie. And, uh, you know, the theory is, is that you can um, create political propaganda by saying something that's so outrageous. Um, it, it is so improbable that people say there's no way this thing keeps getting said over and over unless it's actually real. Um, and this is sort of like the QAnon pedophile ring in the pizzeria or the fact that the election was stolen from you. It is such an outrageous statement um, that uh, that it seems to people uh, that it only has to be true um, because it is, it is such an insane thing. And if it is, it's so insane and I am so uh, incited by this thing. So this is kind of a, uh, you know, acknowledged as being, uh, you know, a political propaganda technique that, that goes back a long time. By the way, Hitler used it as a way to, to uh, use it as almost like a double bluff uh, to blame the Jews um, uh, in uh, in Germany, which was um, uh, you know an unfortunate kind of origin of, of the term, but um, uh, but the term is used a lot now in saying like these sorts of events are ridiculous. Now, what's going to happen going forward? I, I don't think big lies go away. You can try and mute them on Twitter and mute them on Facebook or mute them on Reddit, but whether it's QAnon or whatever is next, um, this is becoming kind of a standard form now because of the way media is distributed. Anyone can say a big lie and it gets a, a lot of listens. We, and, and Trump is totally culpable for that. He made some shit up. He made a bunch of claims. I mean, if, if you guys haven't seen Lindsey Graham's speech yesterday, it is absolutely worth watching that he yes. gave late, late last night. I saw it. I saw it. And he's like, he's like, I asked for the for the show me the, the eight, the 10. Give me 10 people that claim that they voted and they were under 18. He's like, they gave me one. Give me anyone that that uh, was in prison or died and they gave me zero. And he's like goes on and on for a couple of minutes about how none of what was said about what happened in the election was true. And it was all false. And he's like, this is all just not true. Um, and so I think Trump is culpable for creating a falsehood and uh, and, uh, you know, having a megaphone. And, you know, there are certainly what about the inciting of violence. That is, I think, where the rubber is going to meet the road. Trump's going to be out of office in two weeks or less one way or the other. Do you, uh, and let me just take it to Sachs. Um, Sachs, I want to give you the time to respond to the, the issue of uh, the double standard uh, in terms of race and BLM. And then also, do you, Sachs, if you're on Biden's team coming in, do you advise that you prosecute Trump or investigate Trump for this insurrection? Yes or no? Okay, so just, just to tie off on the, the BLM issue, I, I just, you know, I just fundamentally don't think that race is the issue here. Um, Chamath, look, I, I don't know at the end of the day uh, what the fatalities would have been if it had been a BLM protest that, that went awry. Uh, but I will stick to what I said before, which is I predict that you will see more prosecutions come out of this 
of the people who were involved, I'm talking about the people who stormed the Capitol, than we saw from all the, the BLM protests over the summer. I mean, I don't remember any prosecutions coming out of videotape of people being caught, recorded, looting and rioting. And I predict you will see more here. And again, I think another difference, again, the, the, to the extent there's a double standard, uh, I, you know, I remember a lot of left-wing news networks um, calling the, the rioting and looting the summer peaceful protests, which they clearly were not. You even had a book called In Defense of Looting. And I don't hear anybody defending the storming of the Capitol. Nobody on the right. So, to, look, to the extent there's a double standard, I don't know that it accrues to the, the BLM side of this. But look, I think that's kind of beside the point and not, not the real issue here. I mean, Jason, to your question of is Trump responsible? Yes. I mean, clearly. 100%. He, 100%. Yes, because he... He is the one who, who, who put forth this theory that the election was stolen and was constantly repeating it for the last two months. Two months ago, right after the election, there was an article published in The Spectator called Deplorables Don't Riot. It was actually a pretty good op-end. You know, it was written by a conservative. And the conservative's point was that, you know, all these windows and shops have been boarded up in anticipation of potential rioting and looting with the election. And all these conservatives were saying, well, who's do, you know, who are they afraid of? You know, not, not us, not the MAGA folks. Well, and the theory was deplorables don't, don't riot. And, 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 and the right was, was proud of that two months ago. And now we are seeing that, well, no, uh, the deplorables are rioting. What, why is that? What, what changed over the last two months? And what changed is the constant feeding to this group of people, this idea, starting with Trump, but then perpetuated by, you know, different right wing media organizations and other politicians who sort of were, you know, trying to curry favor with Trump. Uh, they were constantly pushing forward this idea that the election was stolen so that mm. these people on the mall who then riot and stormed the Capitol believe that the election was being stolen from them. So, you know, ultimately that responsibility goes is, is, is Trump's. So to be clear and reflecting back to you, you're saying Trump incited sedation. Is that the right word? Well, sedition. I, it's, 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 sedition doesn't seem like the wrong. It doesn't seem like the exact right word to me. I mean, a riot. It was. It, it was certainly a riot. Now, now did now look. I mean, you're talking about prosecuting a legal case. Uh, you know, if you want to look at the legal standard for incitement, it has to be. You know, provoking people to take an imminent lawless act. Uh, did he, pretty did close. He, I think, I think he load, if you want to see that this mob as a gun, I think he loaded the gun. He pointed it in a certain direction, but did he tell them to storm the Capitol? No, not specifically. I think therefore it'd be a very hard case to prosecute, but I think, you know, prosecuting him in a court of law is just, is sort of unnecessary and redundant. I mean, I think that in the eyes of the public politically, he is I think most people see that he's culpable, and I is even that think the most, end of his co political career. I think he's. I think he's disqualified himself from being uh, a, a candidate, at, you know, at a national level again. I mean, if you look okay. again, you just go back two months ago. Uh, look at how much has changed. Two months ago, just in the day or two after the election, Trump had narrowly lost, but there was talk of him starting a new news network to rival Fox. There was talk about he could even be a, a candidate again in, in 2024. It was not off the table. I think now it's it's clearly off the table. And you've seen, it, it's partly because of the Georgia runoffs, which, which we should get to. But again, the Republican candidates, at least one of them, had won that election two months ago, and now they lost. And it, that has a lot to do with Trump's antics in the meantime of just feeding this constant, you know, way, lie about the stolen election. Right, I, think, I think there's a really important everybody. question about, you know, sorry, uh, but is it worth um, prosecuting Trump uh, post fact? Um, you know, does that do more harm or good for, for the country as a whole? Certainly, there'll be a lot of people that would get great satisfaction of putting Trump in prison. And a lot of people are calling for that. But um, we really do need to question the, um, you know, the incredible divide in the nation and what's the best way to, to heal the divide. The objective shouldn't be pursuing justice. Uh, it should be about moving forward. Uh, I'm not suggesting don't prosecute Trump, but I, I, I think that it's worth it's worthy of noting that, you know, th th there is a, a, another way of framing this whole thing, which is what's the best thing to do going forward. Though on the flip side, you could even make the case that one of the best things Joe Biden could do today or tomorrow is to announce uh, a federal election uh, review commission 
uh, to actually look into wrongdoings at the state level with a, bi- a, a bipartisan right. basis. Oh, yeah, 100%. And report back. Yeah. I mean, it's, just it's, slam, it's, it's Bi- a slam dunk case anyway. If, if Biden did that and he, you know, he basically embraced the, the, the notion that a lot of folks are really angry about and said, I'm listening to you, I'm hearing you, let me show you. And at the same time, they did not prosecute Trump and, you know, let him go go off into the distance and do his own thing. Maybe you start to kind of, you know, heal the rift a little bit. But right now, everyone's kind of inflamed. And there is this like, how do we prosecute him? What do we do when he's, you know, do it, you know, and we're, we're just continuing to kind of escalate the the dialogue and, I, I, and increase the rift. I, I just, yeah. So, I, look, I think prosecuting Trump at this point, first of all, it, legally, that might be a difficult case to prove because of the need to prove that the... Um, that he was trying to provoke uh, an imminent lawless action. You know, if he had been at the barricades, you know, pushing people forward, yes. But so I think legally it'd be a tough case. And I think it would be, it, like you said, it'd be unnecessarily uh, divisive and partisan. I don't know why we need to go there. I mean, at the end of the day, any politician's stock in trade is their credibility and popularity. And Trump has fundamentally damaged the perception of him, I, I think, even among the, the right. I have a huge issue with this, and I'll tell you why. It's because the folks that are now going to go to jail were instigated by this guy. And the folks that were there, in many ways, were brought, they were cajoled, they were instigated to travel from, groomed to travel there, to take the time out of their lives, to basically then get fed this rhetoric. And in a moment of just crazy mob-like mentality to act out at the behest of the leader of the free world. There has to be a consequence, not just to those people, because they, in many ways, are not the person to prosecute. To the extent that you are going to put some of these people in jail, which we look like it looks like we're going to. And by the way, let's be honest, there is no inconceivable way that these people get charged with a misdemeanor. That's not going to stand, right? And the worst perpetrators of this, when they get put in jail, will get put in jail for five to 10 years, minimum. And so what are, what are we going to do when we look at ourselves in the eye and say, these poor Americans at the end of the day who were instigated by this guy and he yet again gets off scot-free while hundreds of Americans who were basically in a peak of craziness fed by this guy does something and goes to jail and you have hundreds of lives and hundreds of families ruined. Even if we don't find a way to basically put Trump in jail for this, I can 100% guarantee you I will bet a million bucks that now the Southern District of New York gloves off. Every single state that can go after this guy gloves off. And to the extent that Joe Biden had any incentive to basically like let this go away at the federal level, gloves off. In my opinion, I really, I really, Jamal, really think Jamal, something. Let's say, let's, let's say that folks do go after Trump. What does that do if he gets put in jail or he, you know, gets uh, there, there's some criminal proceeding brought against him? What does that do to the 50 percent of the nation that truly support him and truly care about him? I don't, you know, I don't like 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 the balance of justice versus unification. You know, how I think we we're talking actually about 25 percent of the country. Free I bird. think I don't even oh, think whatever it's that. it is, right? Or whatever it is. Like there's a, obviously a big voting block and a big block of the uh, potential block. I think, I think I think I think of the 70 million people that voted for Donald Trump. I think there are half of them who would equally vote for a normal centrist candidate. Mitt Romney. And Nikki Haley. didn't necessarily believe in Donald Trump. Then I think there's the other 35 million. And I do think that there's a spectrum of those 35. And I think that you probably lost 10 or 15 million of them after the events of yesterday, where they just threw their hands up in the air and said, hey, so wait a it minute. W- it this would is- really only inflame 20 million is what you're saying. Correct. And I, think I there agree are tw- with Chamath on that. Right. And those 20 million people are, you know, sad to say, concentrated in about 10 states that don't functionally matter economically right. or otherwise um and so, so the, ba- the balance of justice versus unification certainly it sounds like you're saying weighs heavily towards justice right like more more folks will benefit from seeing him come to justice or what perceived justice than i think than, what than it'll we'll allow be. i think it'll allow the republican party to recenter itself i think that's better for politics i think it's better for governance it's better for america i think it allows a lot of people to basically wake up out of this haze that they've been in in four years and say wow wait a minute Enough's enough. Like I was on a really bad bender. I did a couple things I really regret. 
and I need, I, I need to recenter myself. How do you not find this turning into a tit for tat, Berlusconi, Italy, Brazil, Israel kind of phenomenon where, you know, oh, future leaders Freeburg. are then attacked and challenged yeah. and taken, the best, taken to court? The best tweet I saw on this was this woman tweeted out that uh, the following. She said, when the Democrats lost in 2016, they knitted pink hats and donated to Planned Parenthood. No, they didn't. And- no, they didn't. <laughs> they invented a ridiculous Russian conspiracy theory. They, David, that, they, they, what, that like 10 people went to jail. The Russia for. hoax. The Russia yeah. hoax. No one it's went to jail. It's not a hoax. For. No Come one on. To, they, what? They were, uh, the Russians were obviously you, trying to you're like the last person. You're like the last person who still believes in this. Uh, well, listen, I, I mean, still look, believe look. that they tried and I still believe, I don't know that they succeeded, but I think Mueller, they tried. Mueller, Mueller spent two years investigating this, tens of millions of dollars, 25 FBI and uh, Yeah, those are all, agents, those are all GOP uh, talking points. The fact is Manafort no, went to jail. For and, something completely unrelated. These guys like the, were you all, must be the last person who still believes that Trump won in 2016 because I, I of Russian that. interference. I think that they, I think he asked the Ukraine for help, and I think he asked the Russians for help, and I think that he would have gladly accepted the help. Now, is it, it was it a, a conspiracy Did that like in the, the rank? No, it wasn't well, a conspiracy. Nobody, we, you can never know it, if it affected it, but it didn't see, this is the election. problem with your Russia talking point is that you're trying to just say because. He didn't get prosecuted, which he's probably not going to get prosecuted for this either. The guy is a serial offender, okay? And they were trying to get information from WikiLeaks, and they were trying to get the the hacks. And so, I don't know why you can so clearly see what he's doing, David, when he incites this violence, and then you don't see that he would he has no moral backbone or character, and that he wouldn't accept foreign aid. He's no, a, no, no, he's it's a not treasonous that. It's not that. bastard. Look, period. Look, here, 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 here's my view, okay? Here's my view is that when you lose an election as a candidate, you have to look in the mirror and ask what you did wrong. Okay. Trump failed to do that two months ago instead of just taking the L and, you know, and he, he could have blamed it on the fact the vaccine was one week late. I mean, there were, there were, he, you know, instead of just accepting the loss, he invented this conspiracy theory that the election was stolen. And he's basically, like Freeberg said, been pumping it month after month. And, you know, his enablers, you know, have, have perpetuated until we had this, you know, total breakdown and storming of, of, of the Capitol. But again, you know, where was the Democratic reassessment of why they lost in 2016? Who on the Democrat side looked in the mirror and said, you know, we shouldn't have lost that election? You know, what did we do wrong? They didn't do that. Instead, they blamed it all on Russian interference or Facebook. You know, all of a sudden, Facebook went from being a darling to being uh, a scapegoat. Uh, and there was uh russian ads being bought with rubles and tons of link forms confirmed done by the russians in order to uh ferment anti-hillary sentiment i mean this, yeah, no, this it's, actually it's, it happened it's now, true to, it's, to it's your true. point Hold did no, no, it actually no, 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 no. affect the election nobody can know that but it did yes, occur. We can. yes we can because yeah it did it did some fsb okay, so now back- you're admitting there was russian interference no so you I, no, were no, before no. saying there wasn't and now you're saying there was I'm I talking mean, that's, about that's I'm talking about why somebody no no it's not because here here's the here's where you're being misleading is yes is it true that there was some FSB operative somewhere buying ads on Facebook yes hundreds but, of them hundreds okay, of them out of thousands out, out, out of billions of impressions okay it was okay. a microscopic number of total impressions of the election and the people who actually looked at those ads thought they were absurd imagine Guys. some operative in, hold, on, hold on let me finish my point imagine some operative in moscow trying to influence the american election by buying f- ads on facebook it, it did they try? Yes. Look, foreign intelligence services are trying all the time. Okay. But was that so they the did re- try? They did try. Yes. But okay. and, was did that- Trump, and did Trump and his family ask them? No, there was no, help. there's no proof of collusion. There was no proof of collusion. Okay. okay. That's what they Mueller- didn't take the meeting. Okay. No, that's what Mueller, he spent two years investigating it and found no collusion. Look, so my point is, again, we're getting off on a rabbit hole here. But my point was, when when you as a candidate lose an election, you have to take responsibility for that. Th- that was not done in 2016. It, it was not done certainly in 2020 by Trump. It is the problem with both our political parties that they would rather invent conspiracy theories and lies than acknowledge why people are rejecting them. Yeah, I Good agree tomorrow. with this. I, I, I would say this. But that is not the point. David, you are right. Okay. Somewhere along the way, we got stuck worrying about 
the pronouns that we use and which bathrooms should be or should not be transgendered while the American middle class was completely gutted from pillar to post. That is what's created the boundary conditions for this. Every single time there's been an insurrection or an uprising or a revolution in America, it has never been about ideology. It has always been about economics. Always. And economics is the tip of the spear in this country, whether we like it or not. It started with the Boston Tea Party. You know, it continued through the Civil War. It has always been about that topic. So we all let it happen. We all have a responsibility to fix it. That, though, is a topic, I think, for another day, because that's the grand arc of what we need to do in our generation and fix this inequality gap. Meanwhile, we do have this tactical issue, which is you have the leader of the free world, in my opinion, and I think in a lot of reasonable-minded people's opinion, instigating essentially at a minimum a riot and at the maximum some form of like Treason. It, idiotic form of, <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I mean, the, the problem is, it's just, it is just like, a, it's just, it's incomprehensible what it is. I, I've fallen on the side that we need to prosecute him now. I was, I was 50-50 on this, but I'll tell you what's tipped me over is, you know, it, if we don't prosecute him, there's this sort of like unfairness to it. I think that's a very good point you made, Shamath. But I also think that he is going we need to wake people up from this fog they've been in to Friedberg and I don't I think we have to free the, Re the the Republican Party to get back to some more version that is reasonable like you are Sachs I would the rather Republican see Party, you the Republican Party has is 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 already rejecting Trump so just look yeah. at what's happened in the last 24 to 48 hours even after this storming of the Capitol okay you had Republicans who pre who were just hours before objecting to the electors, they basically were saying, no, I've changed my mind. Who was that? The, Lindsey Graham, but not well, Ted Cruz, not that other... Kelly Loeffler. Kelly Loeffler. Kelly Loeffler did it, and there were a few other ones who switched sides. Uh, okay. you, had ex you had excellent speeches by Lindsey Graham and, and Romney. I, I agree with that. They spoke very, very eloquently. And just today, Elaine Chao resigned as Secretary of uh, Transportation. I think that's mostly significant. Who's left, she's, David, she's in, Mitch in McConnell's the Republican wife. Party? Yeah. Look, I think, I think after Georgia, the Republican Party was already blamed Trump for that. And now after the storming of the Capitol, they're ready to be done with him. This idea that you need to prosecute Trump to end his somehow end his relation with the Republican Party, I think it will just backfire. Um, I don't think that's what the point is. I think the point is that nobody is above the law. Yeah. And when you when you lead you know what pro look the, the thing with the people that attended this rally is in any other situation and jason you said it earlier these are our veterans these are the people that are like working yeah. good jobs they're trying to just keep america going they've always believed in american exceptionalism there was nothing wrong with that it was just perverted by this fucking scumbag yep he is a complete That's piece it. of shit fucking scumbag He's garbage. And, and I think that's why you have to prosecute him. I think you have to make an example of him. I, I know that they, with Nixon, they took a different approach, but I just think he's too dangerous to leave unprosecuted because every time he has some bad behavior, whether it was the Ukraine, whether it's, you know, Russia, we can debate what level they wanted to engage with the Russians or, you know, in the case of this uh, riotous behavior, you know, I think he's not going to stop. That's the thing that I fear is I don't think he's going to stop. I would rather I would rather take every single person arrested and give them zero days in jail and add it all up and give it to Trump. Well, I I, I wouldn't. I mean, I, I agree with you to to some degree that they were victims of this two month uh, propaganda campaign to convince uh, the right that this election was stolen. I think a lot of those people who were storming the Capitol, they were there because, not to steal an election, but because they were thought they were there to prevent the stealing of an election. And so, yes, they, they have been duped by a lot of people, including, you know, leading with, with Trump, but including a lot of other people who should have known better. Uh, but, but that being said, they did make the decision to hop the barricade, smash the windows, go into the Capitol. There is some personal responsibility. Uh, absolutely. That has to yeah. Occur. We, we can't. And that's we the can't. tragedy of this woman. Like, right. let's talk about this woman for a second. And, and I think it's important to look at this specific case. This is a person who's a veteran, and she was inside the halls already and was trying to breach another area. And she was just shot dead. 
by Secret Service. They might have been protecting the VP. They might have been protecting Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell. Who knows? Um, but they shot her dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I saw it on video. I mean, it's on video. It's unbelievable. And it, yeah. I mean, coming from a law enforcement family, I can tell you that's a clean shooting. If she was breaching and they told her, do not come in here, we're going to shoot you. And they were protect the Secret Service is protecting an asset. They're allowed to shoot you like you can't jump that. And she's a military vet. She's from the Air Force. I mean, what is in her mind? How wound up was she by Trump and by this propaganda? That when they told her, do not breach the second door yeah, inside that, there. By the way, you just said the key word. You cannot be spun up in all of this by Giuliani. He's a fucking moron. You know, he can barely like not wet his pants. Yeah. You know, you're not going to get spun up by Sidney Powell. The only person that can really catalyze this is the person that has the respect that comes with sitting in the seat that's called the presidency of the United States. And he's she's the only one. He's the only one. We all know this. Because if Giuliani was running this rally and said, let's go storm the Capitol, nobody would have done it. We all know this. Look, yeah. What do you think about this woman, David? Like, think about the psychology of this person for a second, the humanity of it. You know, I'll say something. I think, um, man, politics is, um, isn't the problem. It's kind of the manifestation of the problem. If you think about how crazy it is that... I posted a tweet about this the other day because I've been thinking about it a lot. I think it's so crazy that you can show people a TV ad or a, or a Facebook ad and get them to change their mind on what to vote. Like, um, people are kind of shown stuff. And, and the bigger problem is this kind of reductionism that's, um, that's kind of enveloped all of this. You know, if you, if you go back 100 years, I guarantee you people were having deeper, more civil conversations about differences of opinion and ways to govern. And... Um, and and laws uh, uh, to govern us. And I think like, you know, it's so easy to put a 30 second kind of reductionist ad uh, in front of someone, uh, incite their kind of amygdala to, to, to respond and change their mind about something or push them in some direction. And I think that's the bigger issue with like what's been going on is people are kind of being pushed all the way to one side or pushed all the way to the other side um, through this you know, this this very kind of simple process. There is no dialogue to decide what candidate to vote for, dialogue to decide um, what path to take. It, it's it's all insidiary. It's like lock his ass up, you know, kill them. Like everything has become uh, extremely binary. Um, and the grayscale is really the, the reality. And unfortunately, we've kind of really hurt ourselves in this tribalism over objectivism kind of approach to how we uh, talk as a society and how we debate. Um, and as a result, people are pushed over the edge. Uh, and I think this is a manifestation of that broader problem, which I think is probably linked to the internet and short attention spans and well, all this shit that's going on. Well, this is also why uh, I think the GOP has just been completely, you know... But it's not just the GOP. Dominated. Now that, but, but I'm saying they're all... They, they, we, we, I think yeah, it's a good look, segue I mean, into Georgia. But you could say is, the same about AOC, and you could say that AOC is doing the same to the Democratic Party, and they're they're you know equally frustrated with this extremist point of view, or Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders, and they're you know yeah none of them the got the nomination though, right? Is, and none yeah, of them but, got but, cabinet but were, positions. But they, they could have, and they were close, and it was like, hey, look, give everyone a million dollars, okay, great, like, and tax the rich ninety percent, great, like it's easy to say. And and my point is, by the way, I think the root of a lot of this is. Um, is people are programmed to be unhappy, right? That, that's how you instigate people to take action. The, the bottom 10% of Americans make more money and have a better position in life than the top 10% of Kenyans. Um, and it's an incredible statistic if you think about it. Go to dollarstreet.org or dollarstreet.com and you can actually play around and see what different people live like around the world. Yet in the US, we are told at every strata, whether you're wealthy or, or not wealthy relative to others in the United States, that you should be better off. And it is, um, you know, happiness is the difference between expectation and outcome. And everyone's been set an expectation beyond what they currently have. And as a result, through programmatic work that is done on people in the United States, um, uh, we are being told you should be unhappy. Oh, and by the way, here's the short term solution to resolve it. And it's driving an incredible amount of, um, of behavioral shift. And it really threatens democracy, uh, as we saw this week. And you guys will remember my, my, my big loser for the political loser for 2020 was the American uh, Democratic Institution. Uh, and I think we saw that uh, this week. And, and can I, I agree so with that. On the, on the heels of that, can I ask you guys what you think of this 
basically, Pelosi has told Pence, you have to invoke the 25th Amendment or they're going to take up impeachment. What do you guys think about that? I think it's the right thing to do. How do you do I that? I think they have to be, a, there has to be a backstop against this. Well, I mean, is it possible Trump you can't run could do something crazy? Days. You could, oh, well, here's the thing. I, and I, I, I tweeted at Preet Bahar about this. If you are impeached uh, successfully, you can't run again. Um, so I think that this is a, um, a way to put the nail in the coffin of Trump even having the ability to run in 2024, which I think is why the Democrats are on the right side of history on this one. That's my maybe, personal Maybe they it. sign a non-prosecution agreement with him if he resigns. And that, that's kind of the final, you know, I mean, that's I, what I would I, like to see. But J Jason, why can't you trust voters to make the right decision in 2024? I, I um, do I trust voters? I, it's not about trusting the voters. It's more about do I think there should be ramifications for somebody's behavior? That's that's my fear. Is that if he keeps getting away with stuff, he could do something even more violent or dangerous. As Chamat said earlier, it, it's a miracle that a hundred people weren't shot dead, and this wasn't a firefight. I mean, if somebody takes out a gun at any moment during that and people start shooting, we could have hundreds of people, Americans dead, not just hundreds. the four who died. And I think Trump is absolutely capable of doing something in the last 14 days. If he did this 15 days out, why wouldn't he do something else seven days out or three days out? He's a maniac. I mean, this right. is insane, well. deranged, criminal, lunatic behavior. It's completely possible that he could do something more dangerous in the last 14 days. I know that that sounds crazy, but look at what we saw yesterday. I think, I, I think there is like a white knuckle element to the next two weeks. I think we're all kind of white knuckling it to, you know, to see what's going to happen. Uh, we have 300 hours to go till Biden is sworn in. And I've got to admit, like, I, I'm, I'm counting down the hours, you know? It's too uh, insane. Nobody yeah, wants to ev live everybody, like this. Everybody's, feel everybody's feeling that. Um, that being said, I, I just think that I, I'm more on, on free, Freeberg's um, point of view on this, that we have this insane level of partisan warfare in the US. Mm -hmm. It's gone to like a whole nother level. And I just, and, and, and Trump has definitely made it worse. And the storming of the Capitol is the you know, is the zenith of it. It's the apex. But look, the other side's been doing it too. And the question is just how we de-escalate this insane think, partisan isn't warfare. Isn't Biden the de-escalation, Chamath? Isn't Biden like being elected? Part, I, think, I think it is. Yeah. I think it is. It's like we, we picked the most boring candidate who has the most milk toast, middle of the road approach, who, who uh, Lindsey Graham likes and who traveled the world with. I mean, Lady G loves him. Well, to, to the extent that Biden has a mandate, this is it. I mean, and he talked about it the, uh, the, in his victory speech that night, which was which was was quite good. It's about bringing people together. Um, now, look, I mean, the, the, the issue, it, one of the issues is you can't ignore the fact that Democrats for the last four years have waged this insane partisan war against Trump. I mean, let's not even go into the merits, but you had this two year Mueller witch hunt. You then had this uh, impeachment uh you know, crusade, which look, if there was a lot of validity to the uh, impeachment, why wasn't it used as a campaign issue last year? I just think everybody knows. Let me ask you a question. Was, everybody if knows that was hyper partisan. And, and my point is that, yeah, look, I mean, I think it's a good thing if Biden can deescalate things that that is, that is, I think, why he won the election is that he was seen as more of a sane let alternative. Me, let me ask you a question, Sachs. Do you think it would have been? Do you think if Trump had been impeached for the Ukraine? Uh, interference and Pence had taken over, we would not have seen what we were seeing yesterday, and the country would have been further along to healing. <laughs> uh, so you know, no, I mean Pence would not have invited or asked all of his supporters to come to the Capitol to oppose okay. the counting the, the 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 counting of the electors. I look, that was a unique Trump thing for you know. He could not accept the loss and had to keep pushing and pushing and pushing on this idea that he that the election was stolen. Okay, so but, it would have been but, a good idea to impeach. No, him. no, it wouldn't. No, it okay. wouldn't because if you had if you had impeached Trump, and well, first of all, he was impeached. Okay, but if you had voted removed to convict him, if you had removed him from office, the Senate had voted to convict over a phone call. Okay, and look, I'm not defending the phone call. I'm not saying the phone call was perfect. Okay, I know Trump says it was perfect. It was not a perfect phone call, but you can't remove a sitting president for that. Okay, look, it was unseemly or whatever. I think we all know what he was trying to do in that phone call, but you can't remove a sitting president over that. That was hyper partisan. And so, no, the country would be much further 
apart today if you had done that. And and so the question now is, well, how do you bring it back together? And I think I understand where 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 Tramoth is coming from. I think that Trump deserves morally, culpably, uh, I think he, he is some repudiation. Some repudiation. Some. But but I don't believe in locking him up or or prosecuting him. That's only going to make things much, much which worse. Which crime? <laughs> for, for this crime <laughs> we we don't even know what else is out there i mean i think yeah, it, there's other issues out there let's talk about georgia let's let i think we've nailed the trump i mean unless anybody really feels like continuing to talk no. about stacey the social path stacy abrams is a genius i mean my gosh she should be in charge of everything yeah can we get her on the vaccine rollout <laughs> <laughs> Well, Trump. It's incredible. It's incredible. Stacey Abrams did an incredible job on the Democrat side, mobilizing turnout. Um, but the reason why the Republicans lost Georgia is, frankly, Trump. I mean, Trump costs them Georgia. Two months ago, Purdue beat Ossoff in that That's election. Right. He won. That's right. He won. He won. That's and right. and he and won. he's beaten him before. I think he is. Uh, I mean, he's not the most wonderful candidate, but I think he is a better candidate. And he lost because of these antics over the last two months, culminating in that insane phone call that Trump had with the Georgia oh my God, Secretary we of State. Even talked about Raffensperger. that. Raffensperger. Right. I mean, should he Can't be prosecuted for me, that, Sachs? Can't you I just mean, find me 11,000 votes? Look, I, I just think, you know, I, which I don't think one is more prosecutable, sending people to the Capitol or asking them and begging them to find him 11,000 votes? Which one is more prosecutable to you, Sachs, since you're going to no, be framing wait, stuff? Let's, let's <laughs> wait, Jason, hold on. Let, let, let's move on. Let's move away from the whole Trump goes to jail for a second. I just want to I, I think it's important to talk about Georgia because I think, David, you're going to make a point. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, I think we're getting hung up too much on the legalities. And let's just talk about what's right and wrong, you know, which we, is what we can agree on and let, you know, lawyers and prosecutors figure out the legalities. Um, R Ramesh Panuru from National Review had a great quote about Georgia. He said that Purdue and Loeffler could have survived any two of these three being unimpressive candidates, Georgia shifting purple and Trump being a maniac. And unfortunately, you had three out of three, and that's why they lost. If uh, it was a great, it was a great quote. Uh, you know, you had the Raffelsberger call. You know, can't you just find me the eleven thousand votes the day before the election, or two days before the election? I mean, that had to push swing voters and undecideds to the Democrats. And the other thing is that Purdue and Loeffler weren't able to make the best argument that they had, which is if you vote for us. You end up with split. You, you you prevent the Democrats from having all the power in Washington. So unless you want to give all the power in Washington to a single party, you need to vote for us. That was the best argument for voting for them because there's a lot of people in this country who believe in splitting their ticket because they don't trust either party, which is kind of where I'm at. Um, but they were unable to make that argument effectively because Trump was still hanging on to the idea that he was going to be president. No, I think, David, I honestly, I think this comes down to the intelligence of the candidates. Kelly Lofter is a moron. She's an idiot. Uh, David Perdue's a good old boy. He's an idiot. They're just stupid. This actually speaks to a bigger problem, which is the Republicans could do so much better if they could actually find younger, more vibrant, intelligent people. And instead, they find these fucking morons. I don't know where they find them. But, you know, they pulled Kelly Loeffler out of some, like, backstage Dallas beauty pageant and just kind of like fluffed her up and tried to get her to run. She's a moron. Loeffler Lo was a mistake. Loeffler was a Complete mistake. Complete fucking idiot. Did you read the story about her with the WNBA? But I mean, Georgia is I mean, it's unbelievable. Of, they basically... No, but Georgia, Georgia is full of so many incredible politicians and they found that idiot. That, that, that was a huge mistake. If they just voted or, yeah, I mean, the governor made a huge mistake. They, put, they appointed her to the last two months. Uh, I, so I, I agree that she's a particularly weak candidate, but the, the Republicans only needed one of these two uh, elections. And Purdue had beaten Ossoff before. I agree with you. He's not necessarily the greatest candidate of all time, but he has proved better than Ossoff in the past, including November. And the reason why he lost two months later is because what's transpired in the last two months. Biden has acted presidential and Trump has done what he's done. And that, that made all the difference. And, and that, by the way, is why you're seeing the Republicans breaking from Trump. They were already on their way to breaking with him. And then you had this David, storming are, of the Capitol. What are the implications for Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz? I, I, think, I think this was a blow to them because I think that what, what they were doing in terms of uh, opposing the, the, the electors, uh, everybody knew it was sort of cynical and theater. Uh, 
It was theater. theater. It, was, it was performative theater, theater well said. designed performative theater. to curry favor with Trump so that he might endorse them in 2024 for the nomination. And, and it was it was it was opportunistic. And the problem is it backfired horribly. And, you know, people now see it for what it was. And so, yeah, I think it's going to ultimately they tried to do something opportunistic that they thought would help them politically. And I think it's going to hurt them. But wait, I have to ask you guys, do you guys know the backstory of Loeffler? And the Atlantic Dream, the WNBA team? It's, t- it's Honestly, Jason, I'm going to get so angry because she is just a complete piece of shit. Please don't. I, I'm, you can bring it up. I, I think I she's just I just don't think complete, Saxon Freeberg are aware of this, but. I, I think she's a complete piece of shit. She basically. Ahead, tell the story. It, it's basically she was anti-BLM and she was writing letters to the NBA, WNBA to not allow the players to, to be vocal about Black Lives Matter with the you know, after the killing of um, the murder of George Floyd. And uh, so what the team did, if you look at that story, is they backed Warnock. Uh, They got on the call with him. They refused to say her name. And uh, they rallied the support of Warnock, uh, who ultimately uh, beat her. And they refused to say her name ever again. The players on her own team. Courage. If you want to see courage, the women that play in the WNBA are some of the most incredible people yes in the humans. world yeah. these are these are women that have basically stopped their athletic career stopped fame you know stopped all of the attention in some cases stopped fortunes to work on behalf of criminal justice reform to basically overturn you know uh, unjust convictions these women are incredible and yep. then to be suppressed to be able to say what was on their mind kelly loffler is a piece of shit and they basically wore these vote Warnock t-shirts every day at every game. I mean, imagine. And then now they're, I think, going to be forced. Bravo to those women. Yeah, Bravo I give to them. Those uh, women. Sue Bird, I think, is the uh, was the leader of the whole movement. Bravo to her. Yeah, bravo to her. All right, moving on from politics, I think we have to talk, Freeberg, about the deployment of the vaccine. Um, I, I did a p- quick poll on Twitter and Twitter and the American people have asked that Friedberg, the queen of quinoa, be responsible for the vaccine distribution going forward. Really? Da- I'm in. Let's do it. Uh, I, would what is your t- I, would, I, you I would get that vaccine into everyone's arms in 75 days. I mean, it yeah. would, be would be locked and loaded. You would be such a stone oh cold God. lock. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah. I don't know how so that happens. So, Freebird, what would you do I would differently? love to do that. And maybe you could describe... You know, we, we were supposed to be at a million a day. We're at 350, trending towards 400. We did 1.5 million in 72 hours, according to Fauci at one point uh, right after the new year. So we're, we're kind of like halfway where we need to be. What would you do differently? Because the rollout seems we, well, we have it's a, it's more a, it's than a, it, 50% are on the shelves still, it, it not should in be, arms. It, it, it is a wartime scenario. When war is happening, you don't go home at 5 p.m. and wake up at 9 a.m. and clock out for an hour for lunch. And, you know, you don't, uh, oh, well, don't run too fast. You know, you might trip. You don't do any of that. We've created incredible disincentives in the system. By, In, in fact, Cuomo put out a million dollar fine if, uh, if you get your vaccine out of line. I mean, think about the disincentive that creates. Now people are more scared about giving the vaccine to the wrong person than they are incentivized to give the vaccine to the right person. And the reality is this is a group game. This isn't an individual game. It's not about who gets vaccinated first and you'll live and you'll die. We all need to get vaccinated as a group so that we all have immunity so that this virus stops spreading. It doesn't matter if you're individually vaccinated. It matters if we're all vaccinated because that's the only way we're all going to get out of the economic slump that is truly damaging this country right now. And so the first step is create a military style operation, figure out how many feet on the ground, you know, it's, it's all a rate based system, right? How many are you running per day? And then how do you achieve that objective? And over time, you have your target rate per day, you would scale it up over 75 days, or whatever your, your rollout time frame needs to be. And you would say, this is how we're going to get there. We need this number of people giving shots this many minutes apart. And then you go figure out where you're going to give the shots and who's going to give them. Get the vaccines to where they need to get to, take over all the gymnasiums and all the stadiums and all the open sports facilities around the country. People can drive up, stand in line, get a friggin' shot. And 65-year-olds get priority for the first 30 days. And then after 30 days, your 65 and over crowd loses their priority and it's open season for who wants to get a shot. You stand in line, you get a shot. Walk in, 
you got 3.8 million nurses in the United States. You go contract 500,000 of them. You give them a huge friggin' one-time bonus to come and run this program. You run 24-hour shifts in the gymnasiums around the country. People come in, they get shots, they get out. It takes three minutes. If you're feeling weird, if you have risk of allergies, you go sit in the other room, you wait for two hours, and there's a bunch of roaming nurses keeping an eye on you. And you get this thing done. That's it. This is not that complicated. And we can leverage the National Guard to create the infrastructure to support these lines and get these things done. We can go recruit. There are plenty of nurses associations. You can go. People can work overnight shifts and get paid triple overtime, get extra bonuses for doing this. It's a great way to kind of create an economic stimulus around this. We can get this entire country vaccinated in 90 days. And the way that uh, Israel's doing it is a great model. You know, when they run out Describe of- Describe that, yeah. So at the end of the day, if, uh, you know, the, when you open, when you take these things out of deep freeze, you're at risk of them spoiling at that point because the mRNA is very, um, you know, can break. And so it needs to be really cold. And then you got to give the vaccine very quickly. Otherwise, the mRNA can degrade and it's not effective. So and you have the, to defrost it in order to give it. Yes, yeah, so you defrost it. Then it's sitting there. Now you got to give it within a couple hours. And if you got extra doses so sitting at the end of the day- super complicated. Yeah. What they're doing in Israel is they're looking outside. They grab the pizza guy that's on the bicycle truck, on the bicycle cruising by. They're like, do you want a shot? Come on in. They give him a shot. They grab the next guy. You do not need to track everyone that gets a shot. You do not need everyone to show their ID to get a shot. You do not need to X, Y, and Z. All the disincentives that create friction in the system of rolling out the vaccine need to be completely eliminated. There's no qualifying criteria except maybe being 65 and over for the first 30 days. And we've prioritized politics um, over health and safety. We have made it the case that the teachers should get the, the shot first because the teachers unions created an uproar in California and said they're not going to go to work unless they... So now the teachers are going to get it and the essential workers are going to get it, which are people that are working in stores and warehouses and other stuff. And meanwhile, the people that can actually die from this, 15% likelihood of death if you're over 85, are not getting it because they're not technically an essential worker. So the prioritization where we've tried to create these so artificial, dumb. politically motivated systems for defining who gets the vaccine and who doesn't is absolutely killing us and literally killing us. 4,000 people died yesterday in the United States. And so Bonkers. this system is fucked up. The incentives we've, and don't bleep that out because that's exactly what it is. The, no, dis the, fucking, the, yeah. the, the, the disincentives we've created are destroying um, the rollout. Um, the uh, the governors getting involved and creating models of prioritization that are politically motivated are killing us. And, and we should centrally plan this thing. War Production Act, make a shit ton of this stuff. Grab it all. Get 100 million doses distributed into gymnasiums around the country. Get the nurses in there. Get the National Guard to this organize This should have been lines. federal. I mean, that's the key. This should have been a federal effort. So yeah. Central planning is sometimes needed to get shit done. We did it with the War Production Board during World War II. We did it with the Manhattan Project. We th there, there have been countless e examples where we've had to centralize planning for a massive short-term event. And this yeah. is one of those events. And this needs to be um, prioritized and organized centrally. And it needs to have the right-minded people on this, not kind of people that are you know political operatives and not people that are working nine to five. Um, well, the good news this is, is, this is... This is a war. And we need to go win the fucking war. I mean, the good news is Trump, ha Trump has time. He's, uh, he's at Camp David this weekend, so I think he can put some attention to it. Sachs. <laughs> can, I, can I ask a question, Freeberg? Yeah. So, you know, uh, what do you think about just using markets to distribute the vaccine? It's a great idea. I think, you know, you have to get the incentive such that time-based systems are the incentive, right? Because the objective here is mm -hmm. to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. So take that being your objective and then figure out, look, you guys are going to get $1,000 per person vaccinated in the first 15 days. And then you're going to get $500 and then, seven, you know, whatever the, the transition is. And then anyone can sign up to buy doses at a, at a cost. So they, they, they have skin in the game, right? That's an alternative. So let Walgreens and CVS buy. 50 million doses and then they're incentivized to get them rolled out as quickly as possible let them do the work sure um and frankly if a few people have anaphylactic reactions across the country that's just the reality in war you have some casualties this can't be perfect it has to be good enough to win the war um well and by, by the way when, yeah. when somebody goes into anaphylactic shock just to clarify that you all you have to yeah you get an epi shot it's not fatal if you have an epi pen that's right and so um so you know when you get a uh when you get a, um, uh, you know, a vaccine, if you get one of these vaccines, 40% to 60% of people are going to have some sort of reaction. You're going to have a fever because these are, you, these produce a ton of proteins in your body relative to what you would normally, you know, kind of experience with it with a dead vaccine. There's a lot of vaccines in your body. There's a lot of protein in your body. Your body reacts to get rid of that protein. You produce all these antibodies very quickly. So you end up having a fever. You end up having some, some allergic response or headaches or flushing or whatever. So everyone's going to have, a lot of people are going to have some sort of thing. So 
One of the concerns is they want to have nurses available and they want to have this feel like a controlled medical environment. But again, the reality is we have to sack it up. We have to accept the fact that people are going to be uncomfortable. It is not going to be an easy, simple vaccine like you get the flu vaccine at Walgreens. It's going to be a little bit uncomfortable. You may not have five or six nurses surrounding you and getting all the TLC that Americans have become used to getting every time we you know, brush our freaking teeth. And, uh, and we're going to have some people going to anaphylactic shock and they're going to get EpiPen shots and, and you know, um, and we shouldn't be charging $1,500 for EpiPen shots is another, you know, important point. But I think the market-based model could work as well. So hasn't Israel one, done this right? I mean, Israel, they, they moved the old people to the front of the line, but anybody can get in line. If they've got extra doses that day, they just keep sticking people. They keep jabbing people until long. they run out all That's day right. long until they run out. That's right. And, and so got, they're, they're probably at 20% of the population by now. Yeah, I, I, so I, I'm sure we all agree with it everything speaks, you're saying. It speaks to an enormous amount of political incompetence. I mean, it's really, really just unbelievable why we just don't have smarter people in charge of these things. But Sachs, I, I just want to ask you, because, you know, there is the conservative argument on this, which is, um, you know, states, the federal government shouldn't be doing everything and states need to kind of manage their, their populace and manage, you know, what, what goes on locally. You know, what is the conservative? I'm not asking you this and I'm not attacking you. I'm just asking, like, what is the conservative argument for not doing central planning and central um, organization around vaccine distribution and delegating it to states? And, you know, are, are there you know, do you think that there's a case against, um, you know, for that, that that's pretty strong in within the Republican Party and within kind of conservative? No, ranks? I, I, I think if there's a conservative point of view on this, it would just be that let let markets distribute the vaccine. They'll do a much better job. I don't you know, I think whether it's federal or state, the question is who's more incompetent. And I'm not really sure. Um, I mean, I, I think the problem right now is that when you make vaccine distribution fundamentally political, then the debate becomes about exactly who's, what is your position going to be exactly in line, as opposed to just running the most number of people through the process as quickly as possible. We're getting ourselves so twisted up in knots over making sure that the exact right person is in line that we're having, you know, vaccine go to waste. You and know, just having, to put that in context, yeah. 21 million plus doses have been distributed in the United States. 5.9 have made their way into people's arms. In other words, there are 15 million, over 75% of doses have not gone in people's arms. And in California, we have distributed 5.85% of the population's vaccines, but we've only put 1.3 in people's arms. So we are literally a 4x where we should be. We're at 25% of where we should be. It is absolutely unbelievable that this is happening. And meanwhile- If the government- If the government's- if the yeah. government stopped trying to do anything except, you know, look, it, it did Operation Warp Speed. That actually did help get vaccines done faster. But if way, you that, just, that, was just, that was just money, to your point, Sachs. All they did was create a market where they basically pre-bought all the vaccines, whether or not they were going to work, and then f funded the market to go and produce them early. That's all that it was. So to your point, that Operation Warp Speed, for everyone thinking it's some massive centrally controlled effort, it was a market-based incentive. They put it up wasn't a couple, the Manhattan Project, is what they, you're saying. They, they put up a it couple was billion. Yeah, a they, check. They, they, they put up a couple billion dollars and said to all these pharma companies, go produce the vaccine. And if it works, we'll buy them. If it doesn't work, throw them away. But let's get production going. And that was it. Can I, can I use this as a segue? Like, I mean, what we're seeing is sort of we have a bunch of elected officials. We give them, you know, an enormous amount of responsibility. They also get this implied power. And then you just you see sometimes in these acute moments, they're totally derelict. Then I just want to move off of vaccines for a second. Then you get an elected official who is not acutely incompetent, but it seems broadly, grossly and consistently incompetent. And I want to talk about Chesa Boudin. And I, I want to use Oof. Sachs's article, which, to be very honest, David, was probably one of the most incredibly well written things. Well done you have ever created i don't know jason do we have show notes can we put it in we'll put it in the show notes yeah we'll put a link in the show okay. notes um it yeah. is so fucking good what you wrote if everybody folks who are listening have a chance to read david's killer da the killer da um but it basically you know starts with the profile of this young woman seemed like an incredible woman that was killed by this uh drunk driver uh but anyways david do you want to talk about it and yeah just i mean so for uh, the last, with, I'd say for the last couple of months, I've been following the San Francisco uh, 
a couple of San Francisco Police Department accounts on Twitter. And I was noticing these extraordinary tweets, which are getting retweeted a lot, about how they kept uh, arresting and then having to let go of all, all these criminals who are committing burglaries and other crimes. And you could see the frustration of the police department boiling off these tweets. And, you know, ba basically they were subtweeting this new district attorney that we've had, Chase Boudin, who was elected, uh, he's been in office about a year. He was elected at the end of 2019. And so I started doing a little bit of research. And then we had this horrible New Year's Eve killing of this, you know, uh, wonderful young woman, uh, H Hannah Abe, who came to America from Japan for college and stayed here for work. She was just 27 years old. She gets killed by, uh, by, by a, a criminal, someone who was released, who was paroled by Chase Boudin uh, back in April. He had been in jail for armed robbery. Uh, Chase uh, released him as part of a plea bargain. And then he was arrested five more times for stealing cars and other crimes, most recently two weeks ago. And the DA refused to press charges. And that, that's the reason he was out on New Year's Eve. He stole a car. And then there was this hit and run where he killed Hannah and another woman. And so, you know, I had already been noticing this issue. And so I started doing some, some research and I have a research assistant helping me with this. It's the only way I could put something like this together. And we went pretty deep. And we realized that the death of, of Hannah wasn't just an accident or an act of negligence by this DA. It was part of an overall philosophy of decarceration that he has. Bef he, his, his background is very interesting. He was a child of parents who were in the weather underground who, when he was just a baby, committed armed robbery and were part of the murder, which uh, was David, yeah. David, say the words, they were domestic terrorists. Yeah, they were, they were, that's right. They were domestic terrorists. Uh, they participated in an armed robbery against a Brinks truck, which was these were the, domestic it, terrorists that were competent when compared to what we saw yesterday in the Capitol. Like these yeah. are highly capable domestic terrorists to be clear. I, I don't know. Road. I don't know how capable they were their their robbery resulted in the death of two police officers and a Brinks guard, and they were put in prison. His mother spent twenty years in prison. She's now released. Her his father is still in prison uh, for almost 40, 40 years, um, and he, he's described in interviews how his earliest memories are visiting his parents in prison and how this shaped his entire political outlook. And he became a public defender, which I think was a pretty good place for him. I think if I were an indigent, you know, criminal defendant, I would want someone like Chase Booty on my side. And but the problem is he ran for district attorney and he simply doesn't believe in prosecuting huge numbers of crimes, uh, you know, certainly property crimes, burglary, shoplifting, vandalism. And those crimes have absolutely spiked in the city, you know, a 45 percent increase in uh, burglaries in one year, 35 percent increase in stolen cars, 30% increase in homicides. Crimes are through the roof because he simply doesn't believe in putting people in jail. Well, you know, can I just say this? Uh, can I, can I, sorry, let me just uh, point out, there's a, there's a little bit of a history to, um, to this notion that DAs should change the criminal justice system. There's a TED Talk uh, by a guy named Adam Foss. Sachs, I don't know if you've seen it or if any of you guys have watched it. I, I, I was at the TED conference the year that he spoke. But this guy um, basically thought, you know, he made the case that it is the role and the opportunity for the district attorney, for the prosecutor to change the criminal justice system from the prosecutorial side, that you can, um, you know, kind of demotivate jail and, and, and other kind of, um, you know, mechanisms of punishment uh, and, and push for, a, for a, a rehabilitation program as an alternative, and that the district attorneys can take this, this role on of changing the criminal justice system. And it created a little bit of a mini movement, and there was a lot of attention and follow-up after he gave his TED Talk. And I think San Francisco, in, in large part, picked up on the, um, the momentum coming out of this and other similar sort of stories about the DA can really change the criminal justice system. And Chesa Boudin really kind of capitalized on it. In principle, a lot of people are motivated from a good place when they elected him, which is it is unfortunate a lot of people get trapped in a life of crime. And the fact that they're in and out of prison is a result of the fact that they're put into the criminal justice system in the first place. And parole is really harsh on people and, and all these other reasons why people's lives are ruined for simple mistakes. And if they get an opportunity in life, they can fix themselves and they can come out um, 
in a better place. So there is a bit of an origin story. It's not just like San Francisco said, let's get an anarchist to be our DA and destroy the world uh, and, and kill us all. Like, I, I think it came from a good and true place where this all kind of originated. But obviously, the experiment has gone severely awry in San Francisco. And his particular methods uh, and, and his particular actions have certainly caused far more harm than anyone has seen any good, as Sack eloquently they, pointed out. They've started the a recall effort for him, too. Probably. Well, I think, the, I think the danger is not that you have um, an enlightened political philosophy. I think that's actually quite great and that we can experiment. I think the danger is both on the left and on the right, where people cathartically deal with childhood trauma through their job. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know what Chesa Boudin has gone through, and I feel very bad that he had an incredibly hard life, um, or complicated, or maybe not. I don't even know. Um, but I wouldn't want to know that he's trying to deal with his own experiences um, through his job, because that's not his job. Meaning, you know, you don't want an activist DA. I think you want a DA that's enforcing the laws, and what you do want is you want to elect politicians who change the laws to reflect our values. Yeah, that would be a, a better through line, I think. And and really, I mean, if you look at what's happening in San Francisco, I think we've conflated income inequality, which people in San Francisco are very tuned into with essentially junkies, people who are addicted to incredibly hardcore drugs that are very hard to get off of. And we've had more deaths from overdoses of fentanyl than we've had from COVID uh, by a magnitude of four or five. I mean, it is bedlam on the streets of San Francisco. And if you don't enforce a basic rule of law, what happens is the price of drugs gets cheaper, more available, more people try them, more people get addicted, and then more people come from other places because they know you have the lowest price on drugs. And the price of drugs is inversely correlated with prosecution of uh, drug crime. So um, prosecution of crime. So this yeah, is and, why and, San Francisco and, and, and is spiraling. And most, and most drugs are purchased from criminal funds. So, you know, criminal activity goes up to fund the drug purchasing. So that, that, that's the vicious cycle uh, that, that, that's driving San Francisco. And th there's a recall going on. And then in related news, Gavin Newsom is now up to a million signatures in his recall, which I think is two thirds of the way there. Yeah. They have until mid or late February. They're going to get the votes. And I think, I think the question, you know, uh, Friedberg and I talked about this uh, just on a phone call. He and I caught up a couple of days ago. I think it is time, guys, for us to find an incredibly centrist, thoughtful candidate and put them into the recall race um, against uh, Newsom. Friedberg had the best idea, which was Kim Kardashian, which I think is incredible because she is very smart. She's very likable. She's got enormous distribution. She's like a, she's about to become a lawyer. You know, that'll be and, the amazing, and the I, best I think, platform for Kardashian to run for president. Look, you know? it's, it's pretty clear, you know, uh, recognition, influence, fame is what gets people elected, you know, not the best policy and, and not the, the greatest experience from Jesse Ventura to Arnold Schwarzenegger to Donald Trump. Ronald these Reagan. Are, Ronald Reagan. I mean, these are celebrities who I would argue in the case of Jesse Ventura, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and maybe even Donald Trump as well, their celebrity was kind of, you know, it, it had hit its, its, its media driven apex. And, and this was a second act. And, you know, perhaps uh, someone like that is a great fit here. Uh, Kim Kardashian really fits the bill. But, um, uh, you know, I, 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 that's just a shot in the dark. But I do think someone like that needs to go up. Because if you put a po politician up again, it's another one of these eye rolling events. And for, uh, you know, for the, the populace to kind of really find appeal, it has to be a recognized person, you know, broadly recognized and, and liked person. Yeah. Um, could be, I want to add, Jason, I gotta, Jason, it could be you. Governor Jason dot com. Governor Jason. <laughs> I'm not ready I, to I run wanna, for political office. I'm 50. I'm, I'm, when I'm 60, I would consider it actually, but not right now. I want to work. I got to hop too. I think yeah. we all got to hop, but I was going to say yeah. one thing, which is the beginning of today's podcast was probably the punchiest it's ever been. And I think it just mm -hmm. speaks to the fact that there was so there, it, the bar was so high for Trump to have done something that would have actually gotten us to actually argue and interrupt each other. You know, because yes. we've been so incredibly like loving and protective of each other for four years on this topic, but it yes. literally took an armed insurrection <laughs> for right. us to finally. They just even say cracked the besties. Stuff. The besties. <laughs> well, I mean, I think it's good for people to see Sachs, uh, maybe an eye or 
Chamath and Sachs or whoever disagree on some of these cases or, or Freeberg, you know, doesn't believe in prosecuting Trump. I think we actually had a split ticket there where Sachs and Freeberg felt like we shouldn't prosecute Trump and Chamath and I were in the prosecute Trump one. But I think we're all struggling with these issues. All Americans are struggling with these issues of how do you deal with a black swan event? I think that's what's so unique about Trump is, and I think David, you could speak to this is, I don't think the system was designed for his level of crazy, right? Like our system is based on norms and traditions and trust, just like venture investing is. And we see this in venture investing. Some founder goes off the, you know, jumps the fence and all of a sudden, you know. Yeah. I mean, well, we still, I would say our system performed pretty well in terms of being stress tested and well, look, we still got two more weeks. You know, I think we're all kind of <laughs> we're all kind of white knuckling it right now. Yeah, hoping Land nothing. Plane. <laughs> yeah, hoping Land nothing else happens. But but look, if if Trump's goal was a coup, you know, I think it's a strong word. But if it like it totally failed. I mean, he didn't come close to no. uh, to succeeding in a coup. Um, the opposite, you know, in fact. The, the opposite. He's he w- w- again. We talked about how I think his. He destroyed his popularity over the last two months. He he impacted his earnings by negative two billion dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but 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 you know, but but to this point about us agreeing or disagreeing, you know, I saw a whole bunch of uh, fans of the pod like at mentioning me saying, "I wonder what Sachs is going to say about this." I don't know yes. what. Like, yeah, and I'm kind of like. Like, what do they think I'm going to say? Like, they think I'm going to be supportive of this? I mean, <laughs> you know, like, I, I, I think somehow you, Jason, you've programmed the viewers that I like, I'm, I'm somehow like the, the, the Trump, the Trump guy, uh, you know, because you're always trolling me as the Trump supporter. I mean, I, well, I you would believe just, that Russia was a hoax and that no, black people I said, would have been treated the same climbing up those steps. We all know that's not true. <laughs> well, some, we're, we're some rehashing. of these are self-inflicted wounds of your own. <laughs> Gotta take some ownership there. Boys, boys, yeah. I anyway. gotta hop. Okay. I love you very much. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Bessie. I will say one thing before we meet next time. Yes. I guarantee you some highly unexpected and highly impactful thing will occur. <laughs> <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> yeah. Can we get back to talking about SPACs or I The cannot, Bachelor? Yeah. I can or oh, something. my God. We didn't even, we didn't even talk about uh, my SPAC today. Oh, yeah. 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 Anyway. Go ahead. Give it a plug. Go ahead. SPAC no, plug. No, no. I mean, no. just explain to people what you he do. He doesn't need a plug. plug. It doubled today. It's insane. All right. We'll uh, explain IPO, what happened. IPOE, IPOE is merging with SoFi. Um, it's an incredible company led by an incredible CEO, Anthony Noto. Um, you can read a little one pager on my website. But um, anyways, guys, more importantly, to all the listeners out there, Happy New Year to all of Happy you guys. Let's make 2021 kick ass. Yep. Um, I love you guys. Love I miss you. you. Miss you. Right, see guys. you guys soon. Bye. Play poker soon. Oh, look, there's somebody. Yeah, I got interrupted. I got to go. All right, we'll see you all oh, I got interrupted. next time. I gotta go. Take Bye. us out, young Bye, Spielberg. Guys. Take us out, young Spielberg. <laughs> it to the fans and they've just gone crazy with it. Love you, West. Ice Queen of Kinwa. Besties are best. Oh, no, they're not. That's my uh, dog taking a notice in your driveway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's my Abbey Asher will meet me at Blitz. We should all just get a room and just have one big, huge orgy because they're all just <laughs> useless. It's like this like, sexual tension that we just need to release somehow. Your feet. Be- what? <laughs> we need to get merch. Are I'm back. going all in.